Okay, Bio2 students, let's uh, talk about flowering plants now as we move on. And the flowering plants are also called the angiosperms. And when we talk about flowering plants, um, we start getting into things that uh, we're more familiar with. So most people, probably everybody, knows what flower is. And there are lots of different kinds of flowers, as we'll learn, uh, but many flowers uh, most flowers that we call complete flowers have both male parts and female parts on the same flower, although there are exceptions. Uh, as we'll see uh, as we go around class, there are some flowers that are male flowers and other flowers that are female flowers. And then there are whole plants or trees where there's nothing but male flowers on it or, and then another separate organism that is a female flower plant or tree. But in this case, what you see is a plant that we call a complete flower that has both male and female parts on the same plant. So the male parts are collectively called the stamen, which consists of the anther and the filaments. And then the female parts are called the carpal, and that consists of the stigma, the style, and the ovary. Um, there are also, on this particular one, you can see the petals, uh, which are often the bright colored parts of a flower, although that can vary. And then down here, um, where'd my pin go? There we go. There we go. Uh, those are called the sepals. Um, so let's go through the basic parts of a flowering uh, plant now. Now, when we talk about, um, just so, like we did with the pine tree, we're gonna also have an angiosperm or flowering plant life cycle, um, which is more complex than the pine tree and, and very interesting in a lot of ways. So I'm gonna walk you through this and I'm also gonna put up a drawing, a separate drawing that shows you um, my sort of sketch that I normally put up um, in lecture of that. So when we start, uh, we'll start with the male portions of the flower. And uh, remember that uh, when we talk about the angiosperms, they have no real antheridium. And what that means is although they have a microsporangia, which will end up producing the sperm, so we're able to produce the male parts. The idea of not having an antheridium is it, it, it has the reproductive structures, but it doesn't really have the haploid protective structures like the periphyses uh, that we see in things like our mosses and that sort of thing. So no antheridium, um, and that's really mainly what's lacking there is the protective structures. So we call that a microsporangia. It's diploid, and the diploid cell can go through meiosis and produce um, haploid cells. So the microsporangia is going to produce what's called a pollen grain, and that pollen grain is going to consist of a couple different cells. Um, one is going to be called a generative cell, and that generative cell is going to produce two sperm, and one, um, another cell that's going to be produced is called a tube cell. Okay, now in the female, uh, what's going to happen is the, remember that um, flowering plants um, are heterosporous, so they produce two kinds of spores. They produce uh, two different sizes of spores, microsporangia, which are the smaller spores, which are going to be giving rise to the sperm, and the megasporangia, which are going to produce the larger spores, which are going to end up being things like the egg, and those are called megaspores. So the megasporangia, which is also diploid, is going to go through meiosis and produce four megaspores. Um, and three of those are going to die right away, and we're not going to end up using those. But the remaining one is going to develop into what we call the embryo sac. Now, the embryo sac is very interesting because the embryo sac, um, that one cell, is going to go through mitosis three times. So if you had one cell and you went through mitosis once, you'd have two cells. And if you went through it again, you'd have four cells, four. And then if you went through it again, like that, you'd have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You'd have eight cells. I did my math right there, which is good. But 
So you go through mitosis three times with that one cell, but you're gonna end up with actually seven cells. And that's because one of the cells isn't going to divide, it's gonna keep the nuclear information in one cell. So you're gonna end up with seven cells um, from that one um, remaining megasporangia produced cell from the embryo, and that's gonna form the embryo sac. So those are, there's gonna be three, what we call antipodal cells. Uh, two are gonna be polar uh, nuclei. So that's one cell, and it's gonna look kinda of like this. You're gonna have one cell, but it's gonna have two haploid nuclei in it. Um, then you're gonna have two synergid cells, and then the one egg, and the egg is what is used for the reproduction part, okay? And what's gonna happen is what you're used to seeing is normally you'll have one sperm and that sperm will fertilize the egg. So that's normally what happens when we have fertilization and reproduction. We have a sperm that fertilizes the egg and so we end up with two haploid cells that are gonna fuse together and now make one diploid cell. And in animals, that's gonna be called the zygote, and then that's gonna continue on to develop into our animal. In the plant, we have sort of the same thing because we have one sperm that fertilizes that egg, and that's gonna make our new sporophyte, okay? But the other thing that's gonna happen, which is very kind of interesting and, and pretty unique, is that the other sperm, remember producing two sperm, the other sperm's gonna unite with the polar nuclei and form what's called the endosperm. And that's gonna be a three in cell. And I'll show you that in a minute again. And so what ends up happening is what you have in um, the female portion of the ovule is that the, the sperm, um, where the sperm fertilize the egg, you're gonna end up with those being the seeds, so the ovule is going to end up becoming our seeds in the plant, and then the surrounding tissue um, around that is going to be called the ovary, and the ovary ends up being the fruit part of a plant. So when you take a fruit and you eat it or you open it up, the seeds are inside, those are originally part of the ovule, and then the fruit part, which is usually the part you're going to eat in something like a, um, a strawberry or a, a banana or a pineapple. The, the ovary is the fruit portion of that. Okay, so here again is that life cycle again, and you can see um, this is my embryo sac here that I was talking about where you have your antipodal cells, your polar nuclei, your synergids, and your egg. So if I were to sort of draw the embryo sac, it ends up looking like this. So we have our egg. So this will be our egg right there. And then this will be the synergids because those are surrounding it. And then antipodal, um, these are the cells that are on the opposite side. They're anti or opposite of where the egg is. So that's my antipodal cells. And I could apologize for my writing and drawing, uh, but as you already know, um, I could blame it on my uh, tablet pad writing here, but you know I can't write anyway, so let's just not fool anybody with that. So this ends up being then um, our polar nuclei right there. And that ends up being the food that will help this thing grow. So this drawing right here is supposed to be that. Now. Most of the time, uh, I've mentioned this before, but we draw these uh, drawings and we make them look very simplistic uh, where, we, where it looks like the sperm from one part of the plant fertilizes or pollinates the same plant. But in reality, we draw that simple because it's a drawing. We try to make it uh, flow easier. But most flowers do not self-pollinate. And there are different ways they do that. And the reason they don't Cell pollinate most of the time uh, is that genetically you go to all that expense of producing uh, different variation. And if you self pollinate, then you're really losing the benefit of 
sexual reproduction, which is to increase genetic diversity. So there are things like the stamen and the carpal developing at different times. Uh, they might be arranged in a certain way to avoid contact. Uh, sometimes there's a sort of an immune cell function uh, where plants can recognize um, their own uh, pollen and therefore not get fertilized. So there's a variety of ways that plants prevent cross-pollination or, or, or prevent self-pollination so that they achieve cross-pollination, which is a different individual. Um, angiosperm radiation. Uh, radiation in this case, if we haven't mentioned this before, this means like a major evolutionary event. So in the fossil record, when we see a big, large change in the fossil record, we call that um, a radiation, which is a large rapid change over a short period of time. And what we see with the angiosperms is that major radiation begins in the Cenozoic period about 65 million years ago. And um, it closely coincides with the coevolution of the, in this case, things like the insects. So although you might think of plants, flowering plants and insects to be very, very ancient in the fossil record, it turns out that that many of our, most of our um, orders of insects and in our sort of plants, they're relatively uh, newer in the fossil record because there was a lot of evolution that occurred between these groups, particularly insects and plants, but that occurred um, during the um, Cenozoic at the end of the, um, in the, in the, right after the Cretaceous extinction um, with 65 million years ago. That's when most of the large dinosaurs also vanished. So there was this major rapid change in the evolution of species um, that sort of goes along uh, hand in hand with each other. And in this case, it's the angiosperms and insects, but also birds and bats and things of that sort. Uh, when we talk about pollination, um, remember we talked about um, things like with the mosses and rain and wind and that kind of thing delivering the pollen. Well, pollination is the movement of the pollen from one plant uh, to another or one part of the flower over another. And um, so with, with pollination and flowering plants, there's a whole bunch of plant pollinators Many, many of them are insects, but there's also plants that are pollinated by bats and other animals like that and hummingbirds, um, although insects is the big one. And then the fruit part um, is, is related to, in part, uh, the dispersal of the plant seeds. So plants will reproduce and they have their flowers, they'll reproduce and they produce a fruit. Uh, but then that fruit often uh, needs, if it just drops on the ground, which some of them do, um, if it drops on the ground or stays in that spot, then uh, the plant ends up sort of competing uh, with itself. Its offspring drop right where that plant is. So there are a lot of mechanisms that plants use for dispersal so they can get their new sporophyte plants into different spots. So things like fruit um, or things like this, uh, these uh, flower pods after they've developed into their small fruits that can be wind dispersed. Uh, these are all mechanisms um, that help and aid in fruit dispersal and, and ultimately seed dispersal. So in the case of fruits, animals might pick them up and eat them. And as they travel, they either drop the seeds or if they eat the whole thing, it goes to their digestive tract and it drops out of their feces somewhere and grows into a new plant. Those are all kinds of dispersal ideas. Uh, plants have had a huge global impact on or, or can on transforming the atmosphere. So you probably know from bio one or bio four or both that plants and other photosynthetic animals help reduce carbon dioxide uh, and they cool the earth down. And we are currently having issues, as you probably know, with global climate change, uh, which used to be called much longer ago, uh, global warming, which is still referred to uh, every now and then that way as well. But the idea is basically that as you remove 
more and more plants and you have more and more human kinds of activities that increase the amount of CO2, the CO2 level is going up. And what plants help do, if you have a lot of them, is they help drive it back down. So um, I'm, I'm interested to know, because I'm making this video right now in the March of 2020, and right now we're on the COVID-19 lockdown where um, the entire planet, it seems, um, very few cars are moving. We probably have a 50, 60, 70, 80 percent reduction in cars and transport. And I'm interested to know if we'll look back on this time uh, and find that that month or two where we weren't driving as much, um, if it has an impact uh, because we'll have more plants producing uh, or we'll have probably have the same amount of plants um, removing carbon dioxide, but maybe we're not producing as much. Um, and so that maybe will drive that down. But it'll be interesting to know. Plants can be a non-renewable resource or a renewable resource. There, it depends kind of how you use them. Um, at the rate we're using plants, uh, plants themselves are a renewable resource because you can regrow them uh, if you use them at a reasonable rate. Um, but if you're cutting down plants at a faster rate for which they can grow, which we're doing in old growth forests and places like that, then they become a non-renewable resource. Okay, um, I'm gonna say plant structure and growth uh, for the next upcoming lecture. So I'm gonna end it there. Hope everyone's having a good day.